still Twitter to us, twitter.com slash America. Make sure to go there and uh, follow our page. We'd appreciate it. If you're watching on YouTube, like the video right now, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell for notifications. We've got a lot of coverage on the debate. Uh, next week, extended coverage past uh, what we have on Blaze TV. Both of them are going to be really valuable to you. I think so. Make sure to check that out. Matt Peterson is here to preview that debate, which is only, gosh, what, six days away. I've got a few thoughts to share on the whole Maui situation and uh, all these claims about real estate uh, scavengers coming in to buy up homes. But we start by doing the censorship creep. And if you happen to follow the news yesterday, we mentioned it on yesterday's uh, program a little bit. Uh, Glenn Beck and his fabulous podcast that I happen to be on every day. You should check that out. If you like this show, you're probably going to like that one. Uh, senators and others rally behind Glenn Beck after Apple Podcasts remove his show. Now, you know, Glenn is uh, what the second most listened to show, third most listened to show. We were, I don't remember. We were third before Rush. I don't know um, what the situation is now. But the bottom line is a lot of people listen to Glenn. Okay, Glenn is a big host. He's, uh, I, I don't like to remind him of this except when he fails, but he's in the Radio Hall of Fame. He's got thousands and thousands of shows that are out there, and a lot of people, millions of people, listen to him on a daily basis. It makes his head a little big, frankly, uh, but I try not to remind him of the good things in his life as often as possible. Um, what's interesting here is all of a sudden, 3,300 episodes just go poof just disappear. And if you're on Apple Podcasts, you can't get any of them. That's a bit problematic, uh, frankly. Uh, you don't want that to happen. Uh, we, is it fair? Is it right? If you're a fan of the show, you just lose access to it? What does that mean? And of course, understandably, as to what we've seen here over the past few years, a lot of people online were like, wait a minute, this is wrong. This can't happen. Is there a censorship thing going on here? What is going on? As we mentioned yesterday, our hope was this is a little bit of a glitch. It gets cleared up and the shows are back tomorrow, right? Well, pretty much good news on that front. Um, first of all, Glenn tweeted this yesterday. I want to thank everyone on the left, right, and everyone in between who spoke up today. I wish I had better answers from Apple on what happened, but you give me hope that the issue of censorship is still bigger than politics. Then uh, a few hours later, uh, I think it was a few hours later, it was uh, 541 yesterday, looks like Apple restored the 3,000 plus episodes to their platform, but still don't have clear answers as to why this happened. Hope to have an update for you tomorrow on radio. Now, what Glenn tweeted there, and I know this is going to shock you, uh, that some things on Twitter, not exactly accurate, not all 3,000 plus episodes made its, have made its way back onto Apple. As of the time of this taping, I think we're still about 1,900. We don't really have an explanation as to whether 13 or 1,400 of them are missing. We don't know why at this point. We do have some explanation, kind of, on what happened, at least the, uh, the official explanation. A Variety reports Apple says removal of Glenn Beck podcast was related to a trademark dispute that has since been resolved. Now, I don't know what that trademark uh, dispute was actually about, but here's what uh, they said. Reach for comment. An Apple spokesman told Variety that the Glenn Beck program was removed from Apple Podcasts because of a trademark dispute involving Beck's podcast, the, and the issue has since been resolved. The Apple rep declined to provide details on what the trademark dispute was about. And I don't know exactly what happened here. Um, you know, very well could be that uh, some communication happened and it went to an email box that nobody checks and you know, who knows, right? Like uh, these things happen from time to time. That's why I didn't freak out too much yesterday. I don't know that freaking out is always the best uh, response in these situations. You know, we know from the Twitter files that sometimes people, these big tech companies are doing things intentionally. But of course, also sometimes it's not intentional, right? Sometimes these things just do happen. And that's not something necessarily to freak out about. Hopefully in this case, all these episodes are going to go back up and we won't have a problem. We, you know, this is important, right? Uh, and it's important that, you know, these things are stay up there, not just for the sake of, uh, of us and people listening, listening to the show, but like once something, when you do a show like that, people should be able to find it. They should be able to listen to it. They should be able to go back and find out what we were talking about two or three years ago. I think that's an important thing. And you know, it's important to understand, you know, what has gone on. It's a way to understand the news, to follow the news over a long period of time. And of course, the day to day show is vital for people to get. I, you know, I've talked to so many of you that listen every single day, know more about the show than I do. And we always appreciate that. And the question here is, let's take this particular incident out of it for, for a moment. This one may very well have been a mistake. We hope it was. We hope nothing happens again. But we all know 
And we've seen this with so many people that sometimes it's not a mistake. Sometimes it's just someone making a claim of misinformation, malinformation that is that results in a host or somebody's voice being deleted, a digital uh, deletion of, of all of their material. Um, I can't remember who we were talking to. It was some uh, expert years ago. It was uh, someone who wrote um, a book. Off, I can't remember off the top of my head. It was about World War II, and it went through uh, you know, everything that went on with the Jews in, in the ghetto. And he, he referred to it today as a digital ghetto. Obviously, no one's being assassinated, uh, thankfully. But uh, there were these situations where you're being cut off from the world, and your voice can disappear. Think about people who you were really impactful in, in the world of politics not that long ago, five, ten years ago, and think of how many of them are just gone. They got deplatformed, and you never really heard about them again. This is pretty commonplace these days. We've seen reports over and over again of people losing access to you know, things like PayPal accounts and MailChimp accounts and everything because of what they say and how they say it. You can certainly have problems with those things, but why does it have to rise to that level where people have to be silenced? I was recently watching a thing about uh, shock jock radio, kind of from, from you know, Howard Stern and Opie and Anthony and Man Cow and all these. It was some Vice documentary that they were talking about these things. And I watched a clip of it. And you realize that, like, there's so much effort being pl put into place to try to shut people up, to try to make it so you can't hear them. And you might say, well, I don't like that kind of comedy. Well, when did the time die where you just turn the freaking channels? Why is that not an option for most people? You realize that it's not an option for most people for something very specific. And, and this goes back to social media content moderating. Look, if you go on social media, there is a reason for a social media company to make your experience as a user as good as possible. If your feed is constantly filling up with Nazis who are saying all sorts of Nazi things, that doesn't make your experience good, right? You might not want it, unless you're a Nazi. I hope you're not. If you're listening to this show, you shouldn't be. But if you're a Nazi, you might like that stuff. If you're not a Nazi and you want to see recipes and uh, sports scores and what you're getting instead is Nazi stuff all the time, it ruins your experience. So there should be ways for you to control what sort of content you see. You should be able to do that. And there are controls on all these websites that allow you to set up different filters for different type of speech that you don't want to see. Maybe you don't want to see any liberal speech. Maybe you want to see any religious speech. You should be able to turn that stuff on and off. You don't need to be inflicted with opinions that you don't want to deal with. And I know people might say, oh, well, that puts you in the bubble. Well, that's your choice. You're an individual. You're an adult, I assume. And you should be able to make a choice if you want to live in the bubble and never hear anything from a liberal. Go ahead. If you want to be a liberal and never hear anything from a conservative, fine. If you want to never see any sports content, if you never want to see any business content, you should be able to filter that out. And all that stuff exists, which reveals something very specific. The people making these decisions about moderation aren't concerned whether you are offended by the material you see. They're worried that others will see material that they do like. And that material is information that they don't want you to, to consume. Right. It's easy for me to say I don't want to see any you know, New York Yankees content because I don't like the Yankees. However, this is like the Yankees saying, well, we want you to see that content. We want that to see you to see you should see that content. We want you to be inflicted with it over and over and over again because they want control. They don't care if you're having a good experience or you happen to trip onto something that you might find interesting. They're worried that you're interested in it. And to block it from your view is the only way they can think of to actually win the argument. They certainly can't come out and just fight fire with fire, argument with argument, words with words. Uh, that's the way it's supposed to work, and that is not the way it works right now. And this goes deeper when it comes to actual digital content itself. Glenn talked about this on the show, because while this Apple podcast incident uh, may not have been that type of censorship, it is illustrative of what type of thing can happen and has happened to a lot of people. What happened yesterday with the Apple podcast on my program is exactly why ownership matters. It is exactly why elites in the Biden administration, Davos, Wall Street firms like BlackRock, want to consolidate property. That's why they need ownership. It's why the government is so eager to work hand-in-hand -hand with giant corporations. 
If you don't own the platform, the media, the news, or opinion product, then you don't control it. It can be altered without any warning, like it was yesterday, deleted from history, thousands of episodes, over a decade of my work, for no real reason, they can cancel it. This is the future that is being imposed on the world. And if you don't understand it, the day will soon come when the only voices you hear are approved by the ruling class and corporate elites. It's an excerpt from Glenn's new book, Dark Future, available at glennsnewbook.com. As he's pointed out, you might want to get it in, uh, in, a, in a printed copy. Maybe don't uh, just depend on the digital version because you don't know when these things are going to happen. You know, one of the things that has been kind of clear from a lot of this type of censorship has been podcasts. We know that, you know, Rogan had a bunch of episodes pulled down. There's been some censorship. But generally speaking, podcasts have been sort of a free speech zone throughout this era of censorship. Um, that's probably going to change. And the left is coming up with all sorts of different ways that they're going to go after speech on podcasts because they realize how effective it is. You know, it winds up having, you know, moving people and people understand things uh, that maybe they didn't understand before. And it makes them curious about different ideas. That's not what the left wants. That, <laughs> that is the opposite of what the left wants. I want to talk about where we are in the country. I want to talk about um, where we're going uh, in the future. And of course, we have a lot of po politics to get to as well. Matt Peterson is going to join us to discuss next. We were just talking about how digital media could just disappear. And all, what if all of a sudden you can't get the hosts and the opinions and the, the shows that you want? Well, what if the same thing happened with your medication? Probably would be a little bit more serious, actually. Uh, you're talking about you know, maybe antibiotics disappearing before your eyes. Jace Case is here to help solve that situation. Uh, the Jace Case is from Jace Medical. It's a great way to keep yourself prepared for the worst. It's a pack of five different courses of antibiotics that you can use to treat a long list of bacterial illnesses like respiratory inf infections, uh, sinusitis, skin infections, and a whole lot more. It's great to be ready for a shortage if something like this were to happen with our supply chain. Would you be prepared for that? It's also perfect for traveling, especially if you're going overseas and you don't want to deal with a healthcare system uh, over there. If you uh, don't want to get caught unprepared, get a Jace case from Jace Medical. Enter the code STU at checkout. The promo code is STU at jacemedical.com, J-A-S-E medical.com. It's the Jace case from Jace Medical. Joined now by Matt Peterson, editor-in-chief of Blaze Media. And, you know, you've been around for a while. We've done shows together, specials together. But, like, you're, you know, officially on the team now. Uh, can, for people who don't know who you are and, and don't know your background, can you kind of walk people through your journey to get into the seat? Sure. Uh, it was an, an incredible journey. Uh, <laughs> I'm very happy to be in this seat. Oh, welcome. Um, but I have a background in, I started out in education. I thought I was going to go teach, uh, you know, teach the youth about uh, the American founding and so forth and so on. And I did that. I discovered how terrible academia was. You'll, mm. you'll have to forgive me out there. I'm a little slow on the uptake. <laughs> um, so I realized that there was only so much I could do in academia. And I had already been working in media and political consulting and things like that, more entrepreneurial. Uh, and I did that stuff for a while. I mean, saw how corrupt uh, the cities were in Southern California. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's bad. Um, <laughs> and, and also... Great weather, terrible places uh, of government, at least. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And, uh, and, you know, met a lot of great people along the way. And I had sort of uh, given up on, uh, you know, the Republicans and the, mm. the party and thought, we, this is really running out of steam and was really fed up. And then... Uh, Trump appeared, and I thought, well, that's interesting. Uh, it was certainly interesting. <laughs> no one would deny that. <laughs> yes. So I saw this as a sign of life, and uh, uh, my friend uh, Ryan Williams became president of the Claremont Institute, uh, mm -hmm. where I had worked when I was younger, and called me back there, and I thought, oh, they're going to drag me back into politics. Yeah. And they did, and it was a, a, great, uh, a great time during the Trump administration. I mean, we, I created something called the American Mind, AmericanMind.org, which yeah. was kind of an edgy, you know, leading indicator for the right, moving it forward. Um, I was very lucky to have a great team of people helping to build that. And I ran their fellowship program, so I ended up doing something in education after all for a lot of the leaders on the right who are younger. 
everyone from Charlie Kirk to uh, mm. you know fancy lawyers and <laughs> kids in their 20s who are high achieving and the resumes make you sick, you know. Yeah. But we would teach them about the American founding and uh, how it would apply today, and I, I think that was uh, gratifying work. But I knew in, when 2020 happened that. Uh, as great as Claremont is, and I still support it, I was just teaching in their program this weekend. Sure. Uh, we need to do something in the media space, and we need to move things forward in, in the for-profit world. Uh, we need a new commercial cultural movement, uh, and if we don't have that, we will lose. And I saw so many people just begging for that, right, in the last few years. Uh, that led me to go back to the private sector, create a, a co-found a kind of venture firm for the right. We created some media assets. Mm. Blaze ended up acquiring those. Uh, and me. <laughs> they bought you? Yes. God, they, I, you knew you Trump would bring, bring back slavery somehow, I, yes, and here it yes, is. I, here I am, you know. Uh, uh, that's interesting. So, like, bring back to the education part of this, yeah. because did you ever think it would be controversial to teach about the American founding in America? Like, that shouldn't be a controversial topic. I have to say, I mean, if you don't realize this, I mean, there's still people out there like, how, why would you, right? If you, I mean, everyone knows the schools are kind of corrupt now. But... You know, when I started, I look back at my wife sometimes and say, why did we waste that time in the academy trying to teach and do good? Mm. Uh, because it's so bad now and it's so obvious how bad it was. But it wasn't that way, right? I mean, it was in the last 20 years when that really started to turn. So when I started grad school, it was sort of right at the transition period, right, where, um, you know, you still could get jobs in political science and uh, in these, these fields. And there were people throughout the country and different departments who still cared about the American founding. Um, but they were under siege, right? There were a lot of libs there, but they, they sure. were still out there. Yeah. And what ended up happening is, is while I was in graduate school, really, you could see the turn where it became much more belligerent. And, uh, you know, really, when you look at a job description in political science, it's all discriminatory. I mean, it, it's all designed. Like I realized after a while, wait a minute, these people don't want me to teach here. Right. <laughs> me particularly, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Are you, are you Christian? You know, are you the wrong color? Right. Are you, I mean, they didn't want that. And they didn't, certainly don't want anyone teaching about the American founding and putting their nose in the books. Mm. And after a while, my thick skull realized, you know, <laughs> go where you wanted and it's not here. Right, right. right. It's, it's, I think, Looking at the education system is is a big awakening for a lot of conservatives who mm. not only are shocked at what's being taught and how, how kids are being led, yeah. but also that conservatives seem to be really far behind, right? Mm. Like th the left has been moving on this stuff for decades, a generation, yes. right? Like you have the failure of, you know, the weather underground and the violent side of that at mm. some level. Those people move over to academia, right? Yeah. They influence an entire generation of people. Mm -hmm. Um, so how far are we behind, and is there a way to catch up? Uh, well, we are behind, and just a word on that. I mean, it, I, I, one of the things I did is that really, um, you could say the kids call it black-pilled me, so I was depressed about the state of affairs long before okay. everyone else was, yeah. um, before it was cool. So now I'm kind of positive. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to talk about some positive developments now. Oh, great. But, but uh, the reason that I saw how bad things were is because for three years, I evaluated civics and history programs throughout the country in K through 12. So we would go to teachers and test teachers and try to teach teachers in K through 12, um, you know, about the American founding and civics and history programs. And so I would evaluate the effectiveness of the programs trying to do that, right? And so we would test teachers. And what we found was, was appalling and very disturbing. You know, it was way worse than we thought. Uh, than I had thought, and I spent three years, I mean, traveling the entire country, looking around at these different districts and just realized we're not teaching this stuff anymore. So it wasn't even that uh, the left had come in, although they certainly had in a lot of places. We just weren't teaching this stuff. And if you don't teach about your country and why it's good and how it works, people won't know how it works yeah. or think it's good. Right. Uh, and, and when that happens, all of a sudden, you, you really you end up in a kind of generational crisis. And, and that's where we are now. So, um, so yes, we're way behind. But the good news is that you do see a small renaissance in K-12 through education with the rise of the classical academies that are mm -hmm. popping up all over the place. Uh, and you see a lot more awareness on the part of parents that, hey, maybe I really shouldn't just send my kid to these places. You see trust in higher education going down, which is a great sign. Uh, under 50% of Americans trust higher ed for the first time mm. ever in the last few years. Uh, and then you see real signs of life, like what DeSantis, what the governor DeSantis is doing in Florida, 
uh, where he's basically taking over a board with some of my old Claremont friends and mm -hmm. Chris Rufo. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're putting them on the board and they're actually doing the job and you know, retooling that college. And that's the kind of thing that every governor could, they could all do that in red states. Yeah. Ultimately, in red states, the, you know, they're, the Republicans are in charge. And DeSantis has put them on notice, so now they realize, no, no, we need to put people on the board who will really go in there, get rid of the bad people unabashedly, and bring in people uh, who are really going to do the job well. And DeSantis has been able to do this within the structure of his job, right? Like, he's mm -hmm. not ex massively expanding executive power there. He's yes. saying, these yes. are powers I already have. Yes. I mean, why not take advantage of them? This is what everyone needs to realize, and this is the sign of life that I'm talking about. Yeah is that, look, say in Texas, I mean, don't complain about the, you know, don't tell me about the University of Texas at Austin being woke. Mm -hmm. Who appoints people to that board? Republicans are in charge of this process. And, you know, they, to their credit, they've been trying somewhat, but they need to try harder yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and find the right people who will go in there and, and, and not care about, you know, the bad press when they mm -hmm. yell and scream and just get rid of these people and find, uh, find professors who actually care about about history and about America. All right, so we're looking at history. Let's move to today. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever think you'd be living in a time where a the leading presidential candidate yeah. is currently being indicted four times in this country? No, I did not. Um, now, uh, this wouldn't have surprised me the last few years uh, because it's been going in this direction for a while. But I think all the time, and it sounds like maybe you do too, um, what how did I end up being born into this transitional phase mm. where I'm really here? Like, we're all here together right <laughs> it's now. It's weird. <laughs> in a time in which yeah. uh, they're trying to put uh, the opposition in jail. And I, I keep saying this to people because I don't want to be the bearer of bad news. Uh, I think there's all kinds of great things that can happen for all of us in the coming years, as hard as uh, it might be. But they want to put Trump in jail, and they want to put everyone around him in jail, uh, and they're not going to stop until they, they do that. I, you know, so I think there's a, there's a likelihood here that they actually succeed, and people need to wake up to that fact. Yeah, I don't, how are people going to react to that? I, I, I'm, I'm definitely nervous about that, right? Because right? I think most people realize, even when Trump was on stage yet, you know, chanting, lock her up, yeah. that at some level it was like, well, it's not really what we do in America. And when he became president, yeah. he didn't do it, right? Yeah. This is a totally different animal that we're looking at right now. And I, it feels like the country is, is changing. And I think it's going to hit people in the face hard. They got 91 charges here. Are they really going to go 0 for 91? Yeah, no, I know. So it's very likely that um, they, some of these charges do stick yeah. and they go forward with it. And I think people need to start thinking now about how that makes them feel. Um, they're g counting on people not expecting this. I think they're counting on people then all of a sudden you know, becoming enraged, which is righteous anger. Uh, and then they want to see overreaction. Right. And right. so people need to stay away from that. Yes. And we, we absolutely stay away from that and think about how to game this out. Right. What 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 is the right response when, um, you know, the regime, which it really has become, is coming after you and trying to jail uh, not just Trump, but other people around him. I mean, uh, you know, John Eastman is a was a Claremont colleague, is a Claremont colleague and uh, is a, just a, a very nice man, you know, yeah. a, and he's fa gonna face uh, the rest of his natural life in prison if they succeed. Yeah, Eastman was very well respected. I mean, look, you can question what he was pitching at that time, but uh, it's hard to believe that, that we've gone down this road. Yeah. And now here we are, uh, we're in the middle of an actual election where one of the candidates might be in prison at any moment. Mm -hmm. um, and we're less than a week away from the first debate. You know, you're looking at this, you know, the field the way it is right now. Obviously, Trump has the big lead. DeSantis is kind of the number two. There's some others that are challenging there. Mm -hmm. First of all, do you think Trump should go to this debate? And secondly, give me your kind of view of the field as it stands right now. Well, look, I understand why Trump doesn't want to go to the debate. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, he, he doesn't have to, uh, according to the polls. I, I understand that totally. Um, I kind of selfishly just want him to go because I think it's great if he's there. Yeah. And uh, it's great for all of us if yeah, he's there. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think he could, he could show up and uh, not lose any, any points. In fact, just gain them by becoming, guys, I'm here. <laughs> I'm the guy. I mean, <laughs> if I were him, this is what I would do. Yeah. Right? Uh, but I'm not him, so yeah. okay. Uh, but I think it would, it would really enliven uh, the debate, and he could kind of uh, w really push a discussion that needs to happen on the right. People need to 
say, what are we going to do moving forward and how are we going to react to what they're doing? And <clears throat> that debate is real and it would be great if Trump was there. Now, uh, if he doesn't show up, uh, which it looks like he might not, right? Mm -hmm. um, then it really does become about Ron DeSantis and uh, why isn't he the front runner? Is he the, is he the front runner among the second, right. <laughs> second place candidates, yeah. right? So is he really second in a strong way or not? And it's, uh, you know, it's the most, this is now the most important uh, moment of his political career so far. Yeah. Um, all right. So DeSantis, he's had like, a rough stretch here probably campaign wise as, as now that question is being asked. Is he the number two? Is it mm -hmm. someone else? Look at the rest of that field. Do you see anyone? Do you, you think Vivek is, I mean, he's been pretty impressive in these public yeah. appearances. He's certainly a very good communicator. Mm -hmm. Is it him? Is there Tim Scott? Is someone else going to rise from that, that pack and make a, make a run here? Uh, it very well could happen. Someone has, I mean, I think we're in a situation where the circumstances are perfect for one of these candidates to just mm -hmm. have some good answers and some good zingers and rise who hasn't risen yet. Um, on the other hand, I do think we're in a time where the only people who have a shot, it was Trump and DeSantis, and now it's Vivek because he's saying the right things. And, you know, just saying the words is important. Um, yeah. And so that's what he's really good at, right? He's good at saying the yes. words. And so right now that matters a lot uh, to people. So I, I would expect him to have a great debate. Now, uh, as the Machiavellian politics of it are, that he's going to probably come out swinging against DeSantis, and DeSantis is going to have to... Uh, deal with that. And, uh, you know, I mean, he's sort of the, the bulldog in a way for everyone who's MAGA and for Trump is also supportive of Vivek because mm -hmm. they want to see him go against DeSantis and, and knock him down a peg. So, I, I mean, I expect there'll be some fireworks, um, but I don't, I don't really see anyone uh, surging in the polls for very long other than those three gentlemen. Now, it is really interesting because I, I when you look at it from that perspective, of course, why would Trump go? Let yeah. Vivek and DeSantis yes. and everybody oh, yeah. else beat up on each other right. and you stay above it, right? Yeah. But, um, you know, from an American perspective, from an entertainment perspective, <laughs> yes. I'd love to have him there. He really should be there. I hope he does, but we'll, we will see. We're going to have great coverage on, on Blaze TV, of course, of yes. this. Uh, and it's going to be a really fun uh, night. It's on Wednesday next week. Don't miss it. But Matt Peterson is the editor-in-chief of Blaze Media. Uh, thanks so much for coming on the show, Matt, and, and walking us through all this. It's great. Thanks for having me. It's been fun. So if you uh, want to, I don't know, let's say take a flight, you probably want to have a pilot, right? Like you don't want just some random person in the, uh, in the, uh, from the, cock, from the uh, passenger seat walking up there and going into the cockpit. Well, that's uh, what, there's certain things like that where you really do want an expert. And you know, we've had lots of problems with experts. I don't know if anyone's noticed this over the past few years. But when it comes to getting a great real estate agent, you want to have the best. You want to have someone who really knows what they're doing, who knows the market. And that's realestateagentsitrust.com. You go there. It's, they've done the process for you. You're not picking off of a website, like a uh, random website, where you're just seeing people putting ads up there. You're not picking off of a bench where there's a picture of a person like, hey, call me if you want to buy a house. No, you're getting the best agent in your area, and this is a free service to you. Go there now, realestateagentsitrust.com. Whether you're buying or selling a home, get the best price on either side of that transaction. It's realestateagentsitrust.com, realestateagentsitrust.com. Well, the Maui fires have been, you know, terrible, of course, and uh, you probably a uh, good chance you've helped because not the fires. I don't think you would want to help that, but you would help Mercury One. Uh, Mercury One has been doing a great job, of course, getting on the ground really quickly in uh, Hawaii. And so far, I mean, this is an old number now, but we're well over $472,000 in money raised. If you can go to mercuryone.org, you can help the people of this area. It would be really, really uh, highly appreciated. And, you know, it's, it's tough because these people were let down uh, by their government. Of course, there's also tragedy. There's also, uh, you know, all sorts of different things at work here. Uh, not a fire hurricane, though. That's not a thing, as we learned yesterday. Uh, but it is a really terrible situation for these people. So if you can help them out, please go to mercuryone.org. Mercury one org. A lot of the coverage of this particular incident, though, is trying to focus on trying to find an enemy here, right? You know, whether it's global warming, whether it's evil Republicans in their SUVs, or it's uh, real estate speculators. This is the latest one. First came the deadly fires on Maui, then the looters and speculators. Now, 
Looters are one thing, okay? Looters, usually the media loves looters. I don't know why all of a sudden they've turned on looters. As far as I understand, looting is totally okay most of the time, but in this particular case, I guess it's not. So I uh, found that looting was wrong at all times. Now, if you are in the middle of a tragedy and there's no hope for food or water, you gotta give uh, water to your kid, sure. You wanna take a bottle of water, a couple bottles of water? I, I think people are probably gonna be okay with that. But the TV that you just lugged out of the electronics store, really not, it has nothing to do with this tragedy. It has nothing to do uh, with uh, whatever uh, disturbance is going on in society. Here in Maui, it looks like people are going to places that have mostly burned down and looking for stuff, trying to take it out. That's always wrong. We all know that's wrong. But I do want to focus on the other side of this, which is the real estate speculators. The governor of Hawaii is p pitching a policy which would ban people from selling their land uh, and, and their home to outside people, people uh, from the mainland or anywhere else. And does this sound weird to anybody? And you think about it from, it's easy to understand why it makes the media, right? Imagine your life. You've just had a terrible tragedy. Maybe someone you, a loved one has passed away in a terrible fire. Your house is burned to the ground and you get ring -a ling ling from some real estate agent who's trying to make a quick buck. You can understand why that would piss you off, right? But like, is the correct answer to something that would piss you off to ban the entire industry? Is that the right way to react to this? Same thing goes for tourism. We're seeing lots of complaints from individual residents who are saying, I can't believe these tourists are coming to Hawaii. You bastards, our, 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 you know, our house just burned down and people have died and I can't believe you're coming over here to surf right now. And like, I get that instinct. I can see why it feels really hard to deal with something like that in the middle of this, but what about the people on the other side of the island that are totally fine, that run surf shops? Did they just shut their business down too, even though nothing happened to their area whatsoever? Should they turn off their way of life? Should they turn off their, uh, you know, the way they're making ends meet? Are they supposed to suffer? Uh, the tragedy is the tragedy. Do we make it worse for the people who weren't even involved in the tragedy? Do we criticize people who are coming over there? I mean, it seems like now is a good time to go spend money in Hawaii if you could do it. You're going to be helping the humanity. They need their income. I don't know if anyone's noticed this, but, you know, most of the industry in Hawaii is based on tourism. If that stops, that's not going to make the situation better. And on real estate investment, look, sure, there are people who are trying to take advantage of this. This happens every time uh, there's a tragedy. And look, this is something that happens within capitalism. Surely there are bad people who are saying, hey, I want to undercut you in low ball, give you a low ball offer. That's certainly possible. But take this from the other side for a second. Let's say you're a 75-year-old woman who lived in, in this area, and now your house is burned to the ground. And you're thinking to yourself, you know, do I really want to spend the next 10 years getting my house rebuilt, watching the community finally get rebuilt to an area? Maybe I want to spend my years between 75 and 85 in Montana. Maybe I want to spend my years between 75 and 85 in uh, Naples, Florida. Maybe I want to get the hell out of here. Maybe I didn't like it here that much, and this is my excuse to get out. Who knows what the reason is? I'm not saying that, you know, that's the majority of people. I, I would imagine it's a small minority, but to banish uh, the practice of real estate sales, it's going to do what? It's going to hurt people who want to leave. There may be people who just say, you know what? I've had enough of this. I want out. And if somebody's going to come in here and offer me a fair offer for the land that I have, and I don't have to go through this rebuild process, and I don't have to deal with all this myself, you know what? That sounds pretty good to me. I want to get out. I'm not saying that's everybody, but when you make blanket policies uh, against these uh, residents, and you tell them that they are not allowed to sell their own property, and there's going to be some pissed off people there. Some people are going to want to just leave. I'm, uh, you know, would you want to stay? It's hard. You may love your hometown. You may love your home area. But like if your whole area has burned down and there's not likely to be a store where you can buy groceries for the next year, I don't know. Maybe leaving is the thing that you want to do. And you should be able to sell your property if you want to. That doesn't mean that we should be encouraging real estate agents to be calling up and outside speculators to harass these people. If they don't want to do it, they don't want to do it. But like you don't ban an industry because some people are annoyed at phone calls. That's not how this works. It shouldn't work that way. People should be able to sell their homes if they want to sell their homes. And, you know, Governor Green, who's been terrible through this 
and has been pitching horrible idea after horrible idea should not be making the decisions for individual homeowners. They should be making the decisions for themselves. And this is what happens when government gets involved. They constantly do these types of things that don't wind up serving the residents. This is not going to help any resident. Telling them that they can't sell their home is not going to help any resident. We're now seeing that they're being blocked from being able to even view their homes to see what happened so that they can even file an insurance claim. And there is speculation, of course, now that these practices add up to some sort of weird thing that they're doing with the land here. I mean, there, there's already reports that one of the considerations is to just never rebuild this area and just call it a, a national monument or a state monument and put it to the remembrance of the people who died there and then never do anything again. So these people will wind up having to sell their real estate eventually, but not to the highest bidder, instead to the government. And that always works out well, as we know. Look, I understand that passions run high. We understand that uh, over time, people will have all sorts of awful, awful experiences here. This is not going to be easy for these people, and this is why I led this with helping them. MercuryOne.org, MercuryOne.org. If you can do it, please help these people. But on the other side here, we also have to get the government out of the way. The government is going to do, cause more problems than it ever is going to cause good. And we've seen so far the reaction has been completely subpar at the very best. I mean, that's really understating it. Suboptimal is an understatement as to what's occurred here so far. Let people make their own decisions, and you can make your own decision as well to help at mercuryone.org. Grip6 has awesome belts and wallets and socks. This is a company in Utah that sells in the United States, but all over the world as well. And if you've ever gone to Grip6.com and you've checked out their stuff, you know how good it is. If you've bought stuff from them before, you probably continue to buy it because the quality is so high. People love this stuff. And you can customize it, too. Like having one belt is not enough because you can put different designs on there. They're laser etched. They're really, really cool. You can get carbon fiber which is great because carbon fiber does not set off the airline uh, detectors, so you can kind of go through and not have to deal with that nonsense. Grip6.com slash stew. Grip6.com slash stew. You can check out the code stew uh, when you go uh, through the process there, and you'll save 15%. This is stuff that you're going to buy, and then you're going to rebuy more, and you're going to give it as gifts. You're going to love this stuff. If you have someone in your life who uh, might need a new wallet, the wallets are really cool, too. They're carbon fiber. They're really you know different wallets. If you've never had one like this, it's not like the big George Costanza wallet. It's, it's a really cool one. You're going to like it a lot. Grip, the number 6.com slash stew. Grip 6.com slash stew. Use the code stew and save 15%. Less than a week out from the first presidential debate on the Republican side, we have a general election poll. Again, I'd say, I don't know how much you take out of this. I think it gives you a general snapshot as to where we are, and that's about it. But in this particular poll, Biden leads Trump 47 to 46, but a virtual tie. Uh, in, in other words, this is close. I think that's fair to say. Right now, if the election were held, it would be quite close. Now we have a lot to go. Um, uh, I mean, we've got a year of this plus to go. So I wouldn't get too excited about that. But state of the race, I will say, if anything, that's freaking out. Uh, Democrats who said, wait a minute, this guy's been indicted four times. Shouldn't he be at zero percent? The answer to that is no, it's not going to happen. I know it's a shocking thing to many on the left. Uh, President Biden is uh, just getting ready for that campaign. He had that big uh, beach vacation he was on, and now he's going to step in and get back to work as he goes on a, oh no, another vacation. Week-long stay in Tahoe. Yeah. He's going to go from the beach to Tahoe. When, when's the last time you went to, uh, from a beach to Tahoe? How recent was that? Do you remember that wonderful place you had right on the lake? Neither do I. And it's amazing how this gets to happen. I mean, look, the country is better off when Joe Biden isn't doing his job. That is something that I fundamentally believe. So I'm not going to be su super, super critical of him taking a vacation. People are like, well, why isn't he doing anything in, in Maui? You know he'd screw it up more than it already is. So I am glad he's doesn't not doing anything, honestly. But I will say it is amazing that he doesn't get more negative coverage over this. Uh, do you remember? I mean, go back to freaking... Uh, Michael Moore's um, uh, big documentary uh, in, for the 2004 election. 
it started with Donald or with uh, George W. Bush golfing and the fact that he was golfing during the Iraq war. What a bastard. He went on a golf trip once. Then Obama came in and golfed like 10 times as much. Nobody cared. Joe Biden has been on vacation more than any president in history, it seems, and nobody seems to care at all. That's just the way this works. Now, if you're wondering how good of a job he's doing with the economy, Bidenomics is working. Yes, it's working, boys and girls. Bidenomics is a huge success story. Let me tell you all about it. By the way, U.S. mortgage rates have jumped to the highest level since 2002. Yeah, that's amazing. You could see it uh, trickled down from 7 all the way down to about 3% when Joe Biden took over uh, in the in office. And since then, it's been basically a straight shot up the entire time. Now, over 7%. Reports of 8% mortgages are being seen again. This is like Jimmy Carter times all over again. No one believed this was coming back, yet the policies in this country have been that bad. We've had a lot of stuff that's hit us. It hasn't been easy. I'm not saying it has been. Lots of people have made mistakes. Republicans have made mistakes. Democrats have as well. But what the Democrats have tried to do here with Biden has been, it's not a mistake. It's a catastrophe. And it's an intentional catastrophe. I'm not saying they want to see mortgage rates at 7.09%. That hurts their election chances. It hurts a lot of different things. But they've raised these rates. They put these policies into place. They put the spending in that made inflation go up so that they'd have to raise the rates to fight it. These policies are all... Uh, stuck together. And it's been really, really ugly from day one with this guy. And if you're wondering if the economy is going to turn around, remember Janet Yellen is a big part of it. She uh, was, uh, she ate hallucinogenic mushrooms during her China visit. And she said they were delicious, which is good. I will say, if you've ever heard Janet Yellen speak, the only thing that could explain her accent is magic mushrooms. It's some weird combination of like Eastern European and Brooklyn. I don't know what it is. I've never heard an accent like it in my entire life, but I am completely unsurprised that Janet Yellen was using magic mushrooms. We started the show today talking about Glenn being pulled uh, off of iTunes and Apple Podcasts, and it was, a, it was a tough day. It was a tough day. It was kind of a crazy day here. I kind of assumed it had nothing to do with censorship. They were just worried that Glenn would bring his bizarre glass cat onto another show and uh, they may need to ban it. I don't know if that's exactly true. If you missed that interview, it was quite the experience yesterday. Uh, Frank writes in, Glenn's cat is really, really smitten by Stu. And I think that's true. The cat didn't even seem to blink. It's almost as if it wasn't a real cat. Um, uh, The uh, big guy writes in... uh, (laughs) Bergamania is sweeping, sweeping the nation. Not me. It's nothing to do with Bergier. It has to do with Doug Bergam. He's in the debate. Bergamania sweeping the nation. If you don't get on board, you're going to miss the train. Toot toot. And a hashtag AEC, which, by the way, stands for Algorithmic Engagement Comment. We're pleasing the big tech robots so that people will want to uh, get, get this show in front of more people as we go. Um, S. Rice writes, is, I don't know if that's Susan Rice. Oh, gosh. Uh, I will be watching us, too, for debate coverage, even if there is no video. Yeah, I don't know what we're going to do exactly. We're going to have a pre-show, a post-show. We'll be doing extended coverage on my YouTube channel. YouTube.com slash America is the place to go. Sign up, uh, you know, just put the little uh, follow button or whatever it is. Click the bell for notifications. You'll see when we go live, and we'll be doing that coming up as well as I'll be on the Blaze TV coverage as well, blazetv.com slash stew. We also have the uh, Biden shirts available now. Yes, anyone but Biden in 24. Here they are. Make sure to get one. Anyone but Biden 24. Check it out now. Stewdoesmerch.com. Stewdoesmerch.com. The code is stew10.